Today's lecture will be on Chapter 17, Using Securities Markets Both for Investing Opportunities as well as Financing Opportunities. So what are securities markets? They're, a, in essence, a financial marketplace where securities, such as stocks and bonds, are spot and sold. Securities markets serve two primary functions. The first part of this lecture will look at how it assists businesses and corporations in finding long-term funding to finance their capital needs. <clears throat> the second part of today's lecture will look at how individuals, such as you and I, it serves as a place for us to buy and sell stocks and bonds and other securities in order to make money. Let's look at the first aspect, assisting businesses first. So securities markets are divided into two markets, primary and secondary. Primar primary markets handle the sale of new securities and secondary markets handle the trading in securities between investors, every other type of trade. So a security is sold once on the primary market and thus every subsequent sale is done on the secondary market. Oftentimes, offerings of securities are done on the primary market through an IPO. That's an initial public offering or the first offering of a corporation stock. How do we have IPOs? They're often facilitated through specialists known as investment bankers. These people assist in the issue and sale of new securities. There's also institutional investors. Now we're individual investors, but institutional investors are large companies such as pension funds, mutual funds, and other funds that buy securities on a much larger scale. Securities are usually bought and sold on an exchange. An exchange is an organization whose members can buy or sell securities on behalf of their individual investors. The largest stock exchange in the world is the New York Stock Exchange in Lower Manhattan. A specialized type of an exchange is known as an over-the-counter market. This type of exchange provides companies and investors with a means to trade stocks that are not listed on a national securities exchange. The biggest over-the-counter market is the NASDAQ. It's a completely electronic marketplace located in Midtown Manhattan. A governmental agency known as the Security and Exchange Commission is in charge for the regulation of the sale, purchase and sale of securities such as stocks and bonds. It was created in 1934. Whenever a company wants to issue a security, whether a stock or a bond, they have to issue what's called a prospectus. And that's a smaller or condensed version of both economic as well as financial information that a company must file with the Securities and Exchange Commission before issuing stock. And it must also be sent to prospective investors. So let's learn the language of stocks or equities. St equity or stock means ownership. So stocks is shares of ownership in a company. Back in the old days, you used to get a stock certificate when you bought stocks, but everything is electronic now, so you don't get that anymore. So whenever you buy a share of stock, you're buying a proportional share of ownership in that corporation. Remember, only corporations issue stock. A corporation may issue dividends. Dividends is part of the firm's profits that the corporation may distribute back to its owners or shareholders, either as cash or in the form of additional shares. Corporations can choose to have a dividend or not have a dividend, or raise or lower or suspend a dividend. What are the advantages for corporations that issue stocks? Shareholders are owners of the firm, and you never have to be repaid their investment. So when I sell stock, I sell stock on primary market for the first time to an investor. I don't have to pay that person back. I, They now are owners and I have their money. As I said, there's no legal obligation to pay dividends. In addition, issuing stock can improve the company's balance sheet because there's no lie, you don't owe anything. So the assets go up, but the liabilities don't go up as well. 
However, there are disadvantages for corporations to issue stock. Now, shareholders are owners and thus have the right to vote for such things as the board of directors or to amend the Articles of Incorporation. If you issue, when you issue new shares of stock, it alters the control of the company. To the extent you pay dividends, they're paid from after-tax profits and are not tax deductible. There are two main classes of stock or equity. Common stock and preferred stock. All corporations issue common stock. Common stock is the most basic form of stock. Shareholders of common stock have the right to vote for the board of directors and share in the profits if dividends are approved. Some corporations issue a second type of stock known as preferred stock. With preferred stock, owners are given preference in two main ways. The first way is that they have a preference over common shareholders to dividends. In addition, they also have a preference to common shareholders if the corporation goes bankrupt or has to liquidate its assets, which means preferred shareholders would get paid in full before common shareholders get paid at all. A couple other things to note with preferred stock. It may be callable, which means it may be required. You may, if you're the owner of preferred stock, you may be required to sell the shares back to the corporation if the corporation calls it back. Preferred stock may be convertible, which means you may be have the you have the option to convert your preferred shares to common shares. And finally, preferred stock is cumulative, which means that any dividends not paid out to preferred shareholders have to be paid back first before you can pay any common shareholders any dividend. Now let's talk a little bit about bonds. Bonds are not stocks. Remember stocks are ownership. Bond means you have lent out money. So a bond is a corporate certificate indicating that the person who purchased the bond or the bond investor has lent money to the corporation or if a government has issued it to the government. The principal of the bond is with the face value of a bond. Most bonds are issued in thousand dollar increments. And usually bonds have interest. So the payment interest is the payment that the corporation or issuer of the bond makes to the bondholder that compensate them for the use of their borrowed money. There are several different types of bonds here. All these, by the way, are government bonds. None of these are corporate bonds. So these are all bonds, different types of bonds issued by, uh, by the government, federal government for the first four. Municipal bonds are issued by states, cities, or counties. And Yankee bonds are bonds issued by foreign governments. What are some advantages for corporations to issue bonds as well as governments? Well, the holders of the bonds are creditors, not owners like shareholders. Thus, bondholders can't vote on corporate matters. They have no ownership interest. The interest that the corporation pays on a bond is tax deductible. That was not the case if the corporation paid out a dividend to its shareholders. In addition, you may pay, be able to pay back the bond before the maturity date if they're callable. However, there are disadvantages for corporations as well as governments to issue bonds. First, bonds increase the debt of the corporation and affect the market's perception of the company. Paying interest is you have to pay interest. You remember, you don't have to pay a dividend on a stock. And finally, unlike a stock, you got to pay back the face value of the bond or the principal of the bond must be paid back when the bond matures. All bonds have ratings and you can see the three major rating agencies, Moody's, Standard and & Poor's and Fitch. AAA, generally speaking, is the highest quality. And as you get down to, I want to say, as you get down to double B, and that as you start getting into drunk, junk grade bonds, and the, the lower the ranking, the higher amount of interest that the corporation has to offer to entice people to buy the bonds. Bonds will either be secured or unsecured. 
And as you know by now, secured means it's backed by collateral or property or equipment. If it's not secured, the opposite is unsecured or a debenture bond, which is not backed by any specific collateral. Other issues with bonds, you should know what's called a sinking fund, and that's a reserve account set up by the corporation to ensure that enough money is available to repay the bondholders when those bonds become due on the maturity date. And just like with preferred stock, bonds can be callable, which means it permits the corporation to pay off the principal before the maturity date. Oftentimes that happens when interest rates um, go down after you've issued the bond, so you don't want to keep paying a higher amount of principal when you can call the bond back and reissue the bond at a lower interest rate. And bonds, just like preferred stock, can be convertible, which means it allows the bondholders to convert their bonds into shares of common stock. Now let's move over to the second part of today's lecture. Here is buying stocks. And this is for individual investors like you and me. Now back in the day, you had to use a stockbroker who was a representative and worked as an inter market intermediary to buy and sell stocks and bonds for your clients. You don't need this anymore because of the internet. And now there's free trading, which has pretty much made stockbrokers obsolete. So whenever someone's looking to make an investment, they should look at criteria. And here's some of the criteria you should look at. First thing is risk, risk that the, that the investment may go down to zero potentially. Yield or interest that you may make while you're owning the stock or bond. How long you plan to hold the stock or bond. Sometimes I hold things for a few minutes. It could be other times for my lifetime. How liquid is the investment, which means can you get in and out of it quickly or find a seller? And finally, what are some of the tax consequences? Depending on what type of an account you hold it in or what type of security it is, will have tax ramifications. So do, you should do certain things before you as an individual make your first investment in stocks and bonds. Well, take an investing class, such as my Business 121 class, or attend a conference or do a lot of reading. You can see over the long haul, which is since 1926, here really, which is even before the Great Depression, stocks have returned on average over about somewhere close to 10%. Bonds don't return quite as much because they're not as risky as an investment. But no matter if you buy stocks or bonds, it's very important to be diversified. Diversification is the idea of buying several, several different types of investments in, a, in, an F, in an effort to spread the risk of your overall investment portfolio. So you can see, when you diversify, you put some things in stocks, put some things in bonds, maybe something in real estate, or even within stocks, you diversify. You have money in technology or financial or healthcare, et cetera. There are always bulls or bears in a market. A bull is an investor who believes that the stock prices and overall market are gonna rise. The opposite are bears, those who believe that stock prices are going to decline. It takes two to make a market. I wonder if they're gonna put 2020 up as the next time period for drops in stock prices because stock prices just in the last month have dropped over 30%. But you can see this is not the first time, and if you ride these things out, you will do fine in the long run. Hopefully, it's not a bad problem to have what's called a capital gain. And a capital gain is the difference in a positive matter between the price for which you bought the stock or bond and from what you sold it for. So to the extent you have a gain, it's known as a capital gain. You can also pick different types of stocks. Blue chip stocks are usually your largest companies. Growth stocks are ones that are sales are growing at a higher rate, but they tend to be more expensive relative to their earnings. Income stocks usually are cheaper stocks relative to their earnings, but they produce a dividend. And penny stocks you should avoid. Stock splits are actions by a corporation that gives shareholders two or more shares 
of additional stock for every share that you own. However, stock splits cause no change in the company's ownership structure and no change in the investment's value. So when a stock splits two for one, here's what happens. Let's say you owned 100 shares of stock XYZ and it traded for $100 per share and then the stock split two for one. So you had a $10,000 investment, $100 times 100 shares. Now the stock splits two for one. Now you have 200 shares, twice as many shares, but each share is worth half as much. They were worth 100, now they're worth 50. So again, 200 times 50 is $10,000. So don't ever think that a stock split makes you more money. It may give you more shares, but each share will be worth a proportionally less amount. Usually you buy stocks with money that you have. However, you do have the ability to borrow money to buy stock. That's known as buying stock on margin. I would highly disregard, or I would highly tell you not to buy stocks on margin unless you are an experienced investor. This was taken maybe seven, eight years ago, Microsoft. Now, even now, Microsoft today is trading at $150 per share. It was, I think, close to $200 a share before this latest drop-off. But you can see, you can put money into a stock and hopefully make money. Now let's look at not so much investing in stocks, but investing in bonds. So usually novice bond investors ask two general questions. One, do you have to hold on to bond till the maturity date? And the answer is no. Just like with a stock, you can sell a bond at any time. And then how can I assess the investment risk of a particular bond issue? Well, you can do that by looking at the ratings from the three rating agencies, Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor's. Junk bonds are bonds that have very low ratings because they're a credit risk. So you wanna be very careful about purchasing a junk bond. Just as with stocks, bonds, you can go on to Yahoo Finance or anywhere else to find information about bonds as well. Other things you can buy besides stocks and bonds are mutual funds and ETFs. I would highly av avoid buying a mutual fund unless you have to. A mutual fund is an organization that buys stocks and bonds and then sells those shares and those securities to the public. The fund pools investors' money and buys stocks according to the fund's purpose. They usually charge high fees. A better way to buy, if you don't want to buy an individual stock or an individual bond, is to buy an ETF or an exchange-traded fund. These, again, are collections of stocks and bonds that are traded on different exchanges but are traded more like individual stocks and thus have a much lower fee. Most ETFs have fees of under a quarter of 1% or mutual funds can have fees of sometimes two to 8%. There are a variety of ETFs, and I would just do a Google search on different types of ETFs, but you can buy ETFs that just track index funds like the S&P 500 or the Dow or the NASDAQ. You can buy them to, to track a certain industry. So comparing different types of investments, and you can see on the left side, we have bonds, deferred stock, common stock, mutual funds, and ETFs, and look at the different degrees of risk, expected income, and the possible growth. So the Dow, known as the Dow 30, actually, is 30 industrial stocks. So whenever you hear the Dow going up or the Dow going down, it's really the rate of these 30 stocks, although a couple of these stocks that are on the right side are no longer in the Dow. And so the 30 stocks make up the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I believe, along with other critics, that the Dow 30 is too small, and I use the S&P 500 as more of a guideline. The S&P 500 tracks 400 industrial stocks 40 financial, 40 public utility stocks, and 20 transportation stocks to give a better overall gauge of how the markets are doing. And as we said, markets can go up like they had and they can go down like they are right now. The key is not to panic when stocks go down.
though the last collapse before the one that we're recently experienced now happened in 2008 as a collapse of the, the real estate market. But stocks recovered a lot from then. You can never time the stock market because most of the stocks that are traded on both the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ are done through computer programs. So when we have economic crises, who's to blame? Oftentimes you want to blame Wall Street or those, 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 those greedy um, stockholders and owners. And a lot of times they have issues as well. But please don't think that other people don't share blames when there's economic crises as well. Our, our politicians in Washington and even you and I on Main Street who live beyond their means. Finally, one of the key provisions of the last economic crisis in 2008 was the Dodd-Frank Act, and this gave the government a lot more power to regulate the financial services industry. This concludes our lecture on Chapter 17, Understanding Security Markets for Both Financing Opportunities as well as Investing Opportunities.